Welcome back to our study in the book of Genesis. We're looking at Genesis chapter 38, dealing with Judah and Tamar. Jacob's son Judah married and had three sons. The oldest, Er, married Tamar. Er was a wicked man. God slew him. Judah told his next son, Onan, to fulfill his duty and marry Tamar. But Onan was a wicked man, and God slew him. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite, whose name was Hira. Interruptions are often disturbing and annoying to some people, but they are sometimes vital. The story is told about a wife who knew how upset it made her husband to be interrupted in the middle of a project. Consequently, she walked up to him and stood quietly as he worked happily on a project in the garage. In due time, he finished what he was doing looked up, signalled his wife that it was now permissible to engage him in conversation. Her words took him totally by surprise. Calmly she reported, the house is on fire. And it really was. Genesis 38 is an inter interruption also, but a very significant one. In chapter 37, our attention was focused upon Joseph, who was cruelly sold into slavery, and somewhat more appeal appealing alternative than murder. In chapter 39, the principal character again is Joseph, this time in the house of Potiphar, the Pharaoh's officer. Chapter 38, therefore, seems to abruptly interrupt the flow of thought. The chapter is absolutely essential to the development of the argument of the book. It occurs by design, fitting beautifully into the context. While well, chapter 37 had explained how Joseph, and so the entire nation of Israel, wound up in Egypt rather than Canaan, Chapter 38 tells us why this Egyptian sojourn was necessary. Chapter 38 provides a backdrop against which the purity of Joseph in chapter 39 stands out the more plainly. Chapter 39 and following describe the price which Joseph had to pay for the sins of his brothers. Chapter 38 suggests some of the consequences of the sin of Joseph's sale which Judah suffered. The very forces which were active in Judah's day are still at work today. The dangers described in chapter 38 which threaten the very on ongoing of God's purposes for Israel are those which threaten to hinder the program of God throughout his church in our own day. The same God who provident providentially overruled the sins of men to bring about the fulfillment of his purposes then is alive and well and unchanging to this very hour. And it came about that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. Judah saw they had a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and he went into her. She conceived and bore a son, and he named him Er. Then she conceived again and bore a son, and named him Onan. She bore still another son, and named him Shelah, and it was at Chebez that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife from Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar, but Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife, and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so it came about that when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed upon the ground in order not to give offence to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila grows up. But he thought, I'm afraid he, he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. The sale of Joseph was only the beginning of the woes for his father Israel. Directly on the heels of this sin flow the events of chapter 38. Unity among the sons of Israel was never a significant force. The selling of Joseph was only one indication of this, and even here, the brothers were not of one mind about it. Now Judah has chosen to leave his brothers and his father for greener grass, namely fellowship and union with the Canaanites. Judah's trouble began with an association with Hira and a Dolomite. The events of this chapter as a whole inform us that Hira was a close friend and a very poor influence on Judah. Whatever Hiram is mentioned, there is trouble 
in store for Judah. While with Hira at Adullam, Judah saw a certain Canaanite woman whose name is never given. She's only referred to as Shua's daughter. The stress is laid on Judah seeing this woman and Judah saw there. Her outer appearance may have been his only consideration in taking her as a wife. Since this seems to have been influential in his father Jacob's selection of wife, we need not be surprised at this. It was then a mere purely was it was then a purely physical choice. Certainly no spiritual considerations were taken into account. If we remember back in chapter thirty four we're told of Shechem taking Dinah, it is said of him that he saw her, he took her, and lay with her. There's very little difference between those words and what is in chapter thirty eight. Judah saw this woman took her and went into her. Only the last expression differs, but both describe a physical union. The act which angered Israel as sons, the, the point of murder is very much the same as Judah taking of a wife. Three sons were born from this union of Judah, the, uh, the Canaanite woman, Er, Onan, and Shelah. For the first son, Tamar was acquired for a wife. Er, however, was so evil that God took his life. His sins are not detailed, for they are irrelevant to the point of the passage. Onan was then instructed by Judah to marry Tamar and raise up seed to his brother since the headship of the family, the Bathrite, normally went to the firstborn. Therefore this was a necessary act. This is an early reference to what is later known as the Levite marriage. Centuries later, Moses commanded it as recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of her husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. Onan knew that the offspring from his union with Tamar would only be further co- only further the cause of his deceased brother rather than his own cause. To prevent Tamar from conceiving, Onan spilled his seed on the ground. Such an act was regularly practiced, and God took the life of this man for his wickedness also. Honor was condemned for two reasons. First, Honor was disobedient in his action. His society at least commended the raising of seed to a brother's name, and his father had directly commanded it. We're led to infer from the story that Judah never knew why children had not been conceived, for only Tamar would have known the cause. From Judah's biased perspective, it was Tamar who must be the jinx, and this prompted him to withhold his last son. Second, Onan sinned because his motivation was evil. Not only did he Onan sin against his father and Tamar, he sinned primarily against his dead brother. Onan put his own personal interests above his brother's inability to continue the family line. In essence, Onan's act was a product of self-seeking at the expense of others, just as Jews or brothers had no brotherly love, neither did this son of Judah. The enormity of Onan's sin is in its studied outrage against the family, against his brother's widow, and against even his own body. The standard English versions fail to make clear this was his persistent practice, Kittle says. Once Onan was dead, Judah became very reluctant to give his youngest and last son to Tamar. It never seemed to occur to Judah that it was his sons who were the problem, and not Tamar. Therefore, Judah and Tamar. Judah promised Tamar he would give her his youngest son, Sheila, as soon as he was old enough. Tamar waited, but Judah did not fulfill his promise. Tamar devised a plan. Probably Sheila was too young at first to assume the role of husband and father, but more than enough time elapsed to solve this problem. Finally, Tamar was convinced that Judah had no intention of giving Sheila to her. If she were to bear children to carry on the name of her first husband, she must force the issue, she concluded. Now, after a considerable time, she was daughter, the wife of Judah, died. When the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hera, the Adolamite. I was, it was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law has gone up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enim, which was on the road to Timnah. She saw that Sheila had grown up and she had not been given him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, 
let me come in to you, for he didn't know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me, that you may come into me? He said, therefore, I will send you a kid from the flock. He said, moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, what pledge shall I give you? He said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her, and he went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed, and removed her veil, and put on her widow's garments. Not only did Tamar know men in general, she knew Judah very well. Moral purity doesn't seem to be one of his virtues. There's little doubt that this wasn't Judah's first encounter with a prostitute. It doesn't show any evidence of any of the naivety of one who's new to this sort of thing. Sheep shearing was a festive time, when sexual temptation would be sharpened by the Canaanite cult, which encouraged ritual fornication as fertility magic, Kidner says. Judah negotiated terms acceptable to both parties. It's probably a common practice to ask for some kind of pledge since little could be done to force the client to pay after the fact. Judah was therefore not taken aback by Tamar's insistence that some guarantee be given. Not that Tamar had any interest in payment. She wanted only to become pregnant by Judah. But the pledge was given would serve to prove at a later time that Judah was the father of the child who was conceived from this union. Interesting that Islam accepts the first five books of the Bible and tries to enforce the covering of the face of a woman as to protect her purity. When here in 38 a veil covering the face is seen as a sign of a prostitute. When this encounter ended, Judah and Tamar went their separate ways. Judah never knew the identity of this prostitute and Tamar went back to a normal course, a normal routine living as a widow in her father's house. Normally such an affair would have been quickly forgotten, but several events occurred which made this immoral interlude a nightmare that Judah would never be able to put out of his mind. When Judah sent the kid by his friend the Dolomite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he didn't find her. He asked the men of her place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the road at the Anum? But they said, there's been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I didn't find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, There has been no temple prostitute here. Judah said, Well, let us keep them, lest we can become a laughing stock. After all, I sent this kid, but didn't find her. Now it was about three months later that Judah was informed your daughter in law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, she is also with child by harlotry. And Judah said, Bring her out, let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. She said, Please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. And Judah recognised them and said, Phew! She is more righteous than I, inasmuch I didn't give her to my son Sheila, and he did not have relationships with her again. Hira was sent to pay the prostitute and retrieve the pledge which Judah had given her. A subtle but significant change of words occurs here, which is indicative of a serious flaw in Judah's character. Judah thought that the woman in the gateway of Ain was a mere prostitute, a harlot. But when Hira searched for her, he asked for the whereabouts of the temple prostitute. The religion of the Canaanite was so corrupt that prostitution was part of the worship of the god of fertility. Judah and his spiritual and moral dullness was ignorant of such distinctions. To him it was merely an affair. But to the Canaanites it was not to worship. Immorality would almost invariably lead to idolatry, yet Judah was virtually unaware of these dangers. Not finding the temple prostitute, and worse yet, being told that there was a no such person to be found, placed Judah in a very awkward and potentially embarrassing situation. It would seem that someone had gotten the best of him, but he was powerless to do anything about it. Who would ever report a theft to the authorities under such delicate circumstances? The more he sought to find this woman, the more his folly would become public knowledge. These were the kind of stories that were swapped in jest, and Judah had no desire to become the laughing stock of the town. He had tried to find a woman and pay her, better to take his losses and hope this was the end of the matter. 
as one month passed, then two, nearly three, passed by without incident. Judy and I must have begun to breathe a little more easily. It seemed as though he had gotten off easy. The woman had not appeared again, nor was there any sign of his personal pledge. It would never enter his mind that the matter could end up as it did. One day, Judy was informed that Tamer was pregnant. This was not fornication, it was adultery, for Tamer was pledged to marry Judah's third son, Sheila. Judah's righteous indignation must have been awesome. She must be burned. This was an unusually severe punishment, even more than the law would later quite required. The usual punishment prescribed by the law of Moses was stoning. It may have been a subconscious overcompensation for his own immorality. Often we attempt to cover up our own sinfulness by a severity in our response to the sins of others. On the other hand, it may have been even more devious. It's possible in his low spiritual state, Judah saw this as a solution to a problem over which he had long <laughs> agonised. Sooner or later he would have to face the fact that Sheila, his only living son, was pledged to Tamar. Getting rid of Tamar could solve this. Tamar's response to the situation was incredibly subdued and submissive. We might have shouted that Judah was the father of his child from the housetops. We might have sought to maximise his embarrassment. What an opportunity to capitalise on the situation, find satisfaction for the years of delay and deceit in keeping Sheila from her. But she would seem privately presented the evidence to Judah and politically and politely urged him to carefully consider it. She made no condemning accusation, but only submitted the seal, the cord and the staff to Judah. What a shock this must have been to Judah. It never occurred to him he was the guilty party who should suffer the penalty he had pronounced with his own lips. Judah, the forefather of the Messiah, the great-grandson of Abraham, had to say of this woman, she is more righteous than I. Judah may have had some kind of turnabout here, for he didn't again have any physical relations with Tamar. Also, the next time we read of him, he's again back with his brothers and father. What are we to think of Tamar? <clears throat> Tamar is an account of a Canaanite woman who came into the covenant community and who learned to value the heritage of the seed of Abraham. Women in the genealogy of Jesus. Tamar, who dresses and acts like a prostitute. Rahab, who is a prostitute. Ruth, a Moabite woman. Bathsheba, an adulterous woman. Mary, who had to bear the assumption that she was a child out of wedlock. It came about at the time she was given birth, and behold, there were twins in the womb. Moreover, it took place while she was given birth, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread to his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came out as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez, and afterwards his brother came out, who had a scarlet thread in his hand, and his name was Zara. As later in genealogies will prove, this firstborn son Perez was to be the son of Judah, who would carry on the messianic line until the time of David, and ultimately of Jesus. The younger brother similarities. Seth instead of Cain, Isaac instead of Ishmael, Jacob instead of Esau, Perez instead of Zerah, Ephraim instead of Manasseh, and we have an elder brother who has given us his inheritance. Historically, this chapter has much to teach the ancient Israelites. To begin with, to begin with this under, event underscores the necessity of a sojourn in Egypt. Spiritual purity was essential for the purposes of God to be realised. Judah, the son through whom the Messiah would be born, was so carnal he was willing to marry a Canaanite woman, have a heathen for his closest companion, and to enter into an illicit relationship with a cult prostitute. Something drastic had to be done, and the exile in Egypt was God's remedy. They are living among a people who detested Hebrew shepherds, even if the Hebrews were willing to intermingle and intermarry with these people, the Gypsies would not even consider such a thing. 
racial bigotry, if not religious piety, would keep the people of God a separate people. While his stay in Egypt was, in many respects, a bitter experience, it was a gracious act on the part of God. Those Israelites who had gone through the Exodus experience would begin to sense this as they read this account. No Israelite would take this record seriously without a deep sense of humility. Israel's roots were rotten. They couldn't look back upon their ancestry with any feelings of smugness and pride. There were too many skeletons in the closet for that. Instead, they must acknowledge that whatever good had come to Israel was the result of God's grace alone. The Lord didn't set his love on you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest, the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, and the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of the Egypt. This was a lesson too quickly forgotten. took great pride in their ancestry and relied upon the roots for righteousness. Do not suppose you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. The answer to them, we are Abraham's offspring and never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you shall become free? Our righteousness comes only from God. Our first ancestor, Adam, failed but to live by God's standards and thus sinned. All of his offspring who despaired him like Adam are sinners, thus in need of righteousness, not their own. Jesus Christ, God's Son, had come into this world to take our sin upon himself, to bear the penalty for our sins so we can have this righteousness and spend eternity with God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed, Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. The principal theme of this chapter is divine providence, which draws the entire section together. God is at work bringing about his purposes through men who are actively pursuing sin. In chapter 37 and 39 and following God, and following God is providentially at work to fulfill his promise to make the descendants of Jacob a great and mighty nation. In chapter 38, God is at work providentially assuring the fulfillment of his promise to provide a Messiah through the descendants of Judah. Ideally, God's sovereign power and all wise and loving purposes are accomplished through obedient servants. But when his children go their own way, God's infinite power is channeled through unwilling, disobedient men and women who, in spite of themselves, manage to achieve God's plans. This they do unknowingly and often unpleasantly. Who would ever have thought there was any chance of the messianic line continuing through Judah from the initial events of this chapter? Here was Judah, the ancestor of the Messiah, taking a Canaanite wife failing to keep his promise to his daughter-in-law and propositioning a prostitute who could just as well have been a part of a pagan religious cult. In spite of all Judah's sins and in spite of Tamar's impatience, Perez, the forefather of David and of the Saviour, was born. Who but God could have brought such good out of so much bad? The sovereignty and the providence of God are difficult concepts and are easily misunderstood. Since much of what God does in this world is through his providential guidance, it is vital we understand its implications for Christians today. The first is that God the living is necessary for the glory of God. Had we not been given the divinely inspired account of the sale of Joseph into slavery, we would not have imagined that it was part of God's eternal plan. At best, unbelievers will have considered the outcome of the incident good luck or mere coincidence. You see, when God works providentially through disobedient men and women, not only are they the instruments unaware of the hand of God, but so are the onlookers. In chapter 39 we're told, Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Why could this be said of Joseph's master but not of his brother? 
or the Midnight Traders or Hiram or Tamar. It was because God was working through men in spite of themselves. Joseph gave a clear testimony to his faith in God. His good work and divine blessing verified his faith in the God of Israel. Judah did not witness the Tamar as he was bargaining over the price of her services. Hira probably never learned that Judah was, was to play a part in the purposes of God. Well, God can accomplish his purpose without man's cooperation by his divine providential working in this world. He can best be exalted and proclaimed to unbelievers through those of us who trust in him and obey his will. Lest we be tempted to be lax in our spiritual lives, convinced that God's will will ultimately be done anyway, let us remember that God desires to be glorified in his saints. The second implication stemming from the doctrine of God's providential rule is that we Christians must view every circumstance through the eyes of faith. Judah didn't realize at the time that God's promises were being fulfilled through this act of immorality. Joseph didn't fully know that his sale into slavery was going to bring about the deliverance of his brothers and his father. There will be many times in the life of a Christian when it will appear that everything is falling apart at the seams. Tragedy, disputes, divisions, heartache will affect us as long as we are in these mortal bodies. We too must trust that in these times of adversity, there is a God who does work providentially in our lives. This is assurance that we found from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Only the eye of faith will see the hand of God in the hard times of life. If you've got anything out of this chapter at all, please feel free to come back and join us.